generously in her native Kenya to empower women by giving them small loans to start their own business. This is Women on Wealth and I'm Nozi Pombandra. Tonight we profiled Jennifer Ruria. She's the group CEO of Kenya Women Holdings. We also speak to the new president of the Business Women's Association of South Africa. That's uh, Fazana Moore. And we talk to her about the business landscape for women in the country. And the woman redefining the concept of power this week is South African businesswoman and social entrepreneur Wendy Luhabe. <music> So for the last 23 years, Jennifer Ruria has headed up microfinance uh, Kenya Women Holding. Ruria took over what was then a sinking ship and she literally steered it into the success that it is now, helping over 900,000 Kenyan women to access finance. Forbes Woman Africa editor Renuka Methel sat down with her to find out why she has such a passion for growing wealth for women. <music> Women have always been perceived as unbankable and uh, they have limited access to finance. How did you change that perception? How did you earn their trust? Mm -hmm. It has taken a, long, taken a long time and the how is, takes a lot to explain. But it's, it's, it's working with the women and going beyond working with the women, working with the families yes. to realize what families need. Once we realize it is not the woman we are dealing with, we are dealing with a family. And the family is part of the community, remember? So it's, it's, it's identifying what does it the family need. You then identify how are you going to enter that family? And we decided it's through the woman. So it's working with the family, yes. improving the livelihoods of the family through the woman. That's how we have succeeded in reaching, in, in getting the women on and then getting the acceptance that uh, providing um, access to finances for women is not making them rebels, but it's bringing in resources that can support the family's welfare. You started out in 1991. The yes. organization, of course, started in 1981. And yes. you inherited bad debts. That's right. The, the organization was in trouble. That's right. How did you resuscitate it? What were the challenges at that point? The success to any institution, and in fact, to even any corporation, it's governance. I began off in 1991 by streamlining the government structure, the governance structure, the administrative structure, and identifying who really is our client because who really is the focus of this 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 initiative because if you do, you are not clear with that then you go everywhere but governance is so critical systems and procedures is very critical systems that that enhance transparency systems that enhance delivery and systems that enhance accountability for results. And I put those in place, that's how I started. Then I realized it's not, it can't be done by one person. The human resource el element is so critical because working with the poor women in rural areas, poor infrastructure, it required a human touch yep. to help people realize themselves. Because you can't, I've said this many times, and I want to repeat it again, you cannot change a person you can't change a person's life, but you can facilitate that person to change the, the way the world works for them. And so what we did was, if you don't have enough resource, you can't do that. So it's getting the correct, the right resource to work with women and their families so that the, those families can change their lives. How does access to finance change the lot of women and, and society in general? Women have been excluded, they excluded a lot from access to resources. Since in our communities, they don't have a cow, they don't have land, they till it, but they don't own it. They have babies, those babies don't, they are not their babies, they give back to them, but they are not their babies, and they look after them. That disempowers, that dehumanizes. Right. You become a slave. To get out of that, you need to be able to, to have a few coins on a woman's hand, I can tell you from experience and from living it myself as a poor person, 
it, it makes a lot of difference. It gives them a voice. It gives them the strength. It gives them the power to begin. And it's, it's, it, 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 it's, it's replaceable. It does not mean, I want to quickly add, this is not the only thing that empowers women. But it is the entry point to empowering the woman. What have been the achievements for Kenya Women Holding so far? What have been the greatest achievements? Uh, let me us? tell you, the ultimate success for me is that, and I always call it the ultimate success, is that the banks opened, not only opened doors for women, from the manager telling me, Jennifer, do you want the banks to be, counters to be crowded with your women with baskets on their banks. Do you, do you realize how arrogant and you know, insulting that statement was? And I went out crying that day. Today, the banks have opened doors for women. In fact, they are very cute little, you know, um, products for women so that women come there. Everybody, the banks are reporting on gender perspectives and saying women are doing this, women are doing this, and they are, they are doing it proudly that we have so many women in our banks. Have you at any point thought that women's empowerment have, has been overdone and it has been at the expense of the men and the boys? Have you tried to include them in the journey as well? The women have been empowered and what has happened is that the men have left all the roles to the women. Gender roles have reversed. So that women are the ones now that are doing everything, looking after the men, looking after the business, looking at the, after everything. We don't know what the men are doing. I think somebody will have to ask them. But the, the, the fact is when women's roles have increased and men are not taking on, it is not healthy. That is not business approach. So at Kenya Women, what we have realized is that we need to get the family to actually be actors in the businesses that the women have started. So we have seen now Moosh since it shifted. In 1990s, I would never want to see a man even sign a form. This time, we introduce the product to the family, but we make it very clear, the woman is in control. Because, it, and even if it's a family business, it's fine, but can the woman have 50% 50, 50 ownership? And therefore, we are bringing in now the family because we want to create this balance. Otherwise, the women will coll coll collapse under really, really heavy weight. Not just women, but families, families. are in control. That's right, families. Thank you yes. so much, Dr. Rerea, and wish you all the best for Kenya Women Holding. Now, Fazana Mall recently became the president of the Business Women's Association of South Africa. I sat down with her last week to find out what South Africa's business women want and what's standing in their way from actually getting it. Um, I think the challenges for women in business varies depending on the sector and depending on where they are in terms of an income band. Um, certain sectors are more progressive in, in terms of women's development, in terms of the Business Women's Association census, which we do um, annually, the last one done in 2012. Uh, women make up more than 52% of the population, but if you look at them from an executive management perspective and leadership perspective, you'll see that those numbers dwindle down to almost 20% and almost 5% at the top. So which sectors are proving to be the most resilient, where women are finding it increasingly difficult to actually have real representation at a leadership level? I think if you look at the mining sectors, logistics, transport, um, they're more challenged. Um, if you're looking more at um, your FMCG retail, um, your professional services firms, they are starting to be a bit more progressive in the transformation strategies. I think certain industries allow for women to work more flexible working hours compared to others. It just also depends on the demand of the job and flexibility in terms of accommodating the various needs of women as they progress in leadership positions. I think women are challenged in the sense that um, they, in, in, your, in your 20s, uh, you're, you're very career focused. Mm -hmm. As you move um, a, a little older and you're trying to balance both uh, work and home, it becomes more challenging as the jobs become more demanding. So I mean, in some instances, uh, the women make the choice of not taking up leadership positions due to the demands of, of the position. Uh, but if you look at talent retention today and competitive edge in business, mm -hmm. it becomes critical to um, harness the, the 
full power of your talent. And if at intake level you have more than 50% uh, women, if you're looking at your top levels and that's not representative, you may not be keeping the top talent within your company. Right. Also, if you look at it from a business perspective today and you're looking at consumers of goods or services, um, you have over 80% of women now contributing from a consumer perspective. So it does become important to have their views mm -hmm. from a leadership. A lot of issues that you raise in that particular response, maybe let's take a step back and mm -hmm. I want to go back to uh, that balancing act that you say women are tr always trying to juggle, especially as they get into their 30s and moving forward. You're also giving leadership insights through the work that you do. What are you advising women when it comes to finding that balance? Uh, is it a pursuit of uh, something that we should be even doing in the first place? I fully believe that there is a place for women in business today, particularly from a contributory perspective and the diverse views that women bring to business. In terms of progression, in terms of policies and practices, from a business perspective or public sector or government perspective, um, you're seeing the conversations happen more in boardrooms in terms of how it can work. I think we're also in a digital age where a lot of women have access to computers uh, from home. Uh, and depending on the industry can actually uh, work more flexible hours. It's more about harnessing the talent, intelligence and contribution of women. Mm. Um, and I've seen many examples and been involved in a number of companies in terms of their gender diversity and inclusivity policies and strategies who've effectively implemented policies that allow women to progress in the workplace. And I've seen the results from a bottom line mm. profit perspective. We're always talking about women uh, as being champions of women empowerment, but to what extent are we seeing men step up to the plate and maybe also get uh, onto this path and say let's make sure that we get women in their numbers to the top? Well the BW is very excited that we have a male board member and in terms of regional representations, because we have 10 branches across the country, we actually have more men starting to be part of our executive commu committee and contributing mm. to the discussion in terms of supporting women empowerment and development from a transformation agenda perspective. And interestingly enough, um, I was actually chatting to, to one of the leaders of a women's network in the UK um, recently who was down in South Africa, and she said that you're finding that more and more CEOs and leaders who have um, only girl children um, or are looking at, at opportunities for their daughters in the future and are participating in the conversations around women empowerment. Now you know every week that we bring you a woman who is flexing her power muscles on the global stage. This week we're bringing you South Africa's Wendy Luhabe. South African social entrepreneur and author Wendy Luhabe has served on the boards of several organizations in corporate South Africa. In 1994, she pioneered the founding of Women Investment Portfolio Holdings, Whipold, which went on to list on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange in 1999. She was also recognized as one of the 50 leading women entrepreneurs of the world and a global leader of tomorrow by the World Economic Forum. Luhabe was inaugurated as the Chancellor of the University of Johannesburg in 2006. She has recently made inroads into the Royal Fraternity, having recently been appointed as an honorary lieutenant of the Royal Victorian Order for her services as a trustee of the Duke of Edinburgh's International Award Foundation. That's all we have time for for this week's episode of Women and Wealth. Thank you for making the time to join us. Don't forget to keep the conversation alive. That's by following me at Nozi Pombandra or at CNBC Africa. And of course, the hashtag for this show is WOW410. We want to know who is redefining the concept of power in your world. Until next time, stay empowered.